So this is really the key slide, which is the secret plan to take over the world. Um, which hopefully at the end of this talk you'll, you'll understand uh, a bit better. Um, so I'm just going to start by talking normally without using my slides. Um, and then once in a while I'll stand up and, and show something. All right. So if I'm not mistaken, the, <coughs> the topic of the lecture is cognitive capitalism. Um, but for me, this term is misleading, so I, I use uh, actually much more something called netarchical capitalism. And I, I will explain why I use that concept rather than cognitive capitalism. Uh, so maybe explain uh, where I'm coming from, uh, what the P2P Foundation is first. So we call ourselves a global network of researchers into peer production peer governance and peer property. Um, so, I'm going to close that. Um, so what do we mean by peer production? Uh, these are open contributory communities of people who mutualize and share their productive knowledge. So you want to make a house, you want to make a car. Under traditional capitalist logics, it's privatized knowledge that is patented, copyrighted. But increasingly, engineers, architects, designers um, are sharing this kind of knowledge. So you have Wikispeed, which is making a car that is five times as fuel efficient as any commercial car on the market. You have Wikihouse, which can make houses that are carbon, I hope I say it right, positive. So, meaning not only do they not produce carbon, but they actually absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and so you have thousands of these projects. And so what's common is that they have a global open design commons. So they are contributing as global communities uh, to what they need for their production. So that production could be knowledge, as in Wikipedia, could be software, as in Linux, or could be actual physical production. So that's what we study. We study how these people do that, how they govern themselves, and how they, how they deal with ownership issues uh, compared to the classic capitalist system that we know, and also compared to the cognitive capitalist system. Um, so in, in a way, you could say that what I'm doing is a bit of footnote to Marx. Uh, maybe a major re revision in, in two different sense. So, so I, I, correct me if I'm wrong because we have experts here, uh, but I would think that Marx's point of view was that capitalism creates a system with a new class of workers and it socializes production and then they take over and change that production system. That to me is my understanding of what Marx said. Uh, now, if you look at the previous transitions, that's not exactly how it happened. Uh, what happened, in my view, more correctly, when you look at the transition to feudal, feudalism or the transition to capitalism, is that you have a system in crisis that no longer functioning. Um, the crisis of the Roman Empire, 3rd to the 5th century, and the crisis of feudalism, uh, 14th century and up. Uh, and then people, both at the bottom and at the top, look for solutions. They create new patterns of value creation and distribution, which eventually coalesce into a subsystem, and which eventually, uh, after some, usually some crisis, become the new logic uh, of the society. So I think we can assume, this is my hypothesis, that, that instead of workers taking power politically and then changing the system, that we actually would see in this society in crisis that workers are, and others, are changing their patterns, their value creation distribution patterns to solve the issues, the systemic crisis, and that this is coalescing in a new subsystem that eventually could become a dominant system. So, so in other words, what I'm doing and what people like me are doing, we actually go back to the, to the, the, the really key idea 
that the mode of production and the relations of production are key. Uh, not, so the politics are derivative from that change in the economic and social sphere and not the other way around. I, I hope that makes sense as a hypothesis. So uh, just to give you an example of how this could work, uh, one of the best books I've read recently, and I hope you've read it, otherwise I strongly recommend it, it's called The First European Revolution. 975, 1025, or it could be 1050, by Richard Moore. Has anybody read this book? No? Okay, then I can fantasize about it more. Okay, so, so what is it about? So what, what I learned from this book, first of all, is that from the 5th to the 10th century, the social structures of the Roman Empire did not really change. So in other words, you know, this idea that the Roman Empire breaks down in the 5th century and then creates a new system is actually not exactly how it happened. So what happened is that the political s superstructure fell, uh, but the, the, the essential social structure, meaning masters, slaves, and freemen, remained pretty much a dominant social logic, uh, even after the fall of the Roman Empire. The difference being that you know, a new group of people took over the political structures, uh, but essentially not changing uh, that much in, in, the, in, the, in the logic of value creation. So just a short historical uh, memory. So 8th century, Charlemagne tries to recreate the Roman Empire. It doesn't work. And he divides up the Frankish Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, into three. three so Western, uh, the Western part will, will become... France, the eastern part will become Germany eventually, and in the middle, that's where I used to live, the Flanders and Burgundy, Lothering, uh, which was uh, in the middle of those two. That doesn't work either. So by the 9th century, according to Richard Moore, you have this total dislocation uh, of, of the territory. So it kind of, in the language that I would use today, it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer feudalism is emerging. So the baronies, right? So every little lord creates his own castle. And the castle is not just to defend himself against the other castles and, and potential invaders, but also as a mechanism to exploit the local peasantry. Um, but it, it leads to an enormous uh, period of social dislocation. So that's what he describes in the beginning of this book. For example, the militias, and that's how they call the, mili the mil milites of that time, which will become the knights eventually, uh, are stealing massively from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the gold. They are mistreating massively the local populations, raping, beating, etc. And at some point, and I think this is 975, uh, there are demonstrations. So it's the monks of Cluny uh, with the Virgin Mary, followed by the people uh, of those regions, so mostly southern France, maybe northern Italy, northern Italy, that start confronting the feudals with their sins. You know, in a time where everybody is deeply religious, this has a very powerful impact. And it actually works. Uh, so, in this period, you have the signing of 300, maybe 500, I forgot the exact figures, what are called charters for the peace of God. And basically, the, what the social contract says is, make love, not war. So, the feudals promised the church to expand through marriage and no longer to permanent strife with their neighbors. Uh, primogeniture becomes, in, 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 in a mere 50 years, primogeniture becomes the mainstream uh, way of um, inheritance. So what it means is that the oldest son gets everything, and so, he, so they don't have to fight between families, but they don't also have to fight within the family, right? Um, so all this pacifies, to, to a large degree, the social relations, um, and uh, so there are protection mechanisms that the feudals accept against the, you know, the common people and also for the church. The price that is paid, so that's the social contract, on the other side is that it's the beginning of enclosures. So in other words, the right to hunt 
uh, becomes recognized and so from that moment on the commoners can no longer hunt for meat it becomes poaching um, and therefore they have to farm much more right okay so what, what am I trying to say I'm trying to say that in the 10th century there was a shift from one value regime to another right from a, a value regime which was based on plunder you you maintain your social position through warfare to a value regime based on land and the serfs which are bound to the land. Uh, so the surplus is now derived from a more intensive exploitation of the land. Right? It's the beginning of the wheatization of, of Europe. So wheat becomes a general crop um, at the time as well. So this is one example of a shift in value regime. I, I hope that makes sense. Now, we probably see something very similar in the 15th century. You probably remember the book by Barbara Tuckman. Uh, I forgot what it was called. The Terrible 14th Century, I think. Uh, which this describes uh, the crisis of feudalism. So by the 15th century, we have a, a series of responses that start consolidating with each other. And I, I guess I would argue that the 15th century is the beginning of the commodification, right? of a value shift from a, a land-based extraction system to a system that is increasingly based on commodification. So on trade, um, Italian cities, um, et cetera, et cetera. So by the 18th century, you know, this becomes fully-fledged fully uh, capitalism. So I am, guess I'm arguing that something very similar is happening today. So that lots of people today faced with the three systemic crises of capitalism, with that I mean the sustainability crisis, climate change, resource depletion, uh, the sixth by extinction of animal life, etc. A crisis of fairness and, and distribution of wealth, increasing inequality not only between nations but within nations, and the third one uh, is the privatization of knowledge, which I think is also a big uh, systemic crisis because it, it's it's um, it impedes innovation uh, in this society. Think about pharmaceuticals, they're hardly innovating, etc., etc. So, okay. Um, so, um, okay. one, one of the terms that is used is, of course, uh, cognitive capitalism. And I, I'll just give you what I think it means and then my, my little critique on it, right? So, I think the people that stress that we have reached a stage of cognitive capitalism mean three different things. Uh, one is that value is extracted no longer directly in physical production but through the knowledge control of physical production. Does that make sense? So I, I think the example I would take is Apple which doesn't produce anything itself. Uh, it's done by Chinese companies and their, and their workers. Yet extracts 70% of the value, of the surplus value to its control of the supply chains and the branding and the consumer side and everything that goes around, it, right? So that's for me one, uh, one thing. I think the other thing probably you will, you will agree with me is the shift to financialization. So exploitation <coughs> through credit, much more than through labor itself, especially in the West. I, I think that would be the case. Um, and the third aspect would be the privatization of knowledge, IPs and patents. Um, I think the American economy, I, I'm not sure about the exact figures, but it's actually mostly an economy that depends on this IP economy more than anything else, right? It's the control of knowledge through IP that determines the, the value capture. Um, so this is, I, I think, the idea of cognitive capitalism for me. So a regime of capitalism where the value is not extracted directly you know, in the factory through labor, but in whole society through the exploitation and control of knowledge. Now, Mackenzie Work has written a book about this, which is called The Hacker Manifesto. It's another book I really, really recommend. Um, it's a bit of a strange book. It's written as a series of, how do you call it? Um, vignettes. Vignettes. Um, but they are very powerful. I, I don't know if you're religious or not, probably not. Uh, who knows? 
Uh, but if you like the the uh, um, how you say the evangel um, one of the gospels, but not a recognized one, uh, how you call it? Anyway, Apocryphal. of Thomas, right? The it's it's a it read, the, uh, it's agnostic, uh, not not canonical uh, uh, book, and it's called the Evangelium of uh, Thomas. It's fantastic. It's really interesting. It's like written. It could be written today. Well, that's a bit the style of that book. It's you know very strong statements, a bit like Nietzsche too. You know these really strong short statements, um, and it's you know it's like a symphony. It's, it's an amazing book. But in it, he makes a thesis which I think is um, is mistaken uh, because he, he basically he says the class struggle today is between the hacker class and the vectoral class. So the hacker class is the class that produces knowledge but doesn't own the means of production. So within a cognitive capitalist regime, right, it's known the labor and the owners of factories that matter, it's the hackers, the knowledge creating class, the symbolic producers, if you like, and the vectoral class, which control the new means of production. Uh, I, so why do I think this is a wrong assumption? Because I think today that's exactly what has changed. Uh, today, um, I think, since I would, I would put it in 93. So if you look at the history of networks, and network-based society, uh, I would argue that you know 1973 is the invention of the microchip. It takes a while to get personal computers and then connected computers. Um, and this is for me the basis of neoliberalism, this first phase of networks, when they are controlled by large companies which starts reorganizing global supply chains. Um, in that period, it was still the case that knowledge workers did not control their means of production. However, since 93, so think about personal computers, and think about connected personal computers, think about the, ne the democratization of access to networks. So for me, it's the, the invention of the browser and the World Wide Web. I can't remember exactly when that was, but I think it's October 93, right? So from October 93, we have a new situation where the creators of knowledge own their own means of production. Now, in what ways Facebook and YouTube and Uber and Airbnb different from the idea of vectoral capitalism? And why should we call this with a different name? Um, you know, some people have called it platform capitalism. Um, and I would call it net article capitalism. So let me show you a little uh, slide on this. I think it's here. Yeah. Uh, so, so my thesis is that the general infrastructure of society, of economics and politics is, is becoming the networks. Right? Networks which allow increasingly direct peer-to-peer -peer relationship building. Permissionless peer-to-peer -peer communication. Now, what that means is, if you can communicate permissionlessly, you can self-organize permissionlessly. So it's not just one-to-one. -one. It's the capacity to organize human groups. And then in particular, the derivative from this is the capacity to self-organize value production and value distribution. Right. So it's not just about communication. It's a generalized capacity through technology for people to self-organize and imagine and carry out different ways of value production. So this is kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about a value shift, right? <coughs> now, the way in which this technology is then applied <coughs> will, of course, depend on the forces that are involved and responsible for that implementation, right? That makes sense, right? So. In this view, of course, technology is not, it's not technological determinism. One, a technology has a univocal you know, result, a bit like I think Jeremy Rifkin sometimes does in his book. It's, you know, because we have this technology, therefore, this is where society is going. It's more the idea of 
you know, there is a new field of possibility, right? A new affordance to technology, and different peoples with different motives will fight for influence and in creating new realities based on these new possibilities, right? So, the people who finance technology, of course, will have a de determining, determining role. The people who develop the technology, I think, you know, they have their own agency, hacker, the hacker class, in this sense. The, the developers, the designers have their own agency, subjectivity. Just give you one example. Um, this, is, this was a survey in the largest design school in Alto in, uh, in Finland. I think it's the largest design school in the world. And here's the, what they were asked. You know, what do you want to do with your design education? 98%, or it's in the 90s, declare that they want to engage in sustainable design. So, so the design of sustainable products and services. Okay? So they have agency, that's their agency, that's their social imaginary, right? Now, they find a job. How much percent of these students can effectively engage? Only 2%. Right? But that doesn't destroy their agency, that doesn't destroy their imaginary, right? So one of the explanations for social entrepreneurship is that, is that the fact that more and more young people have a different value system and you probably read the Washington Post yesterday about the majority of American young people rejecting capitalism. Um, so they have an agency, they have a, a social imaginary which is not compatible with the command and control systems and the profit motivations of where they work. Now if you don't have a technology, if you don't have an affordance, you have no choice. If you have an affordance, if you have the capacity to self-organize, to create other value streams, then you have the capacity to exit that system. Maybe not fully, but there is a, there is a potential there to invest your imaginary into new solutions. And of course, referring here very much to real utopias as being what that is, right? So it's not about doing what you want, it's about doing wanting to do what you want and then compromising, fighting, influencing the reality that you encounter. Um, then the third, so I said the finance, the developers class, and then third would be the consumers, the users, which are increasingly also have this agency to change the technological tools. You probably know that within the sphere of P production we talk about producers with an S instead of a C, Right? Because every user becomes a potential producer in these open contributory systems. So the kind of very stark division of labor between producers and consumers is disappearing to a certain degree in these contexts. Okay. So we have what I call value sensitive design, right? These different forces fighting for influence through various capacities and powers they may have to influence the design of technology and the kind of thing you, thing you can do with it. So, so what is anarchical capitalism? Well, anarchical capitalism is the shift from capitalism that is based on negating exter negative externalities to a form of capitalism that is based on exploiting positive externalities. This is a big shift, right? Traditionally, historically, capitalism destroys the commons. The, actually, capitalism has begun, according to, what's her name, Alan Maskins Woods, in the English countryside, by the enclosure of the land in, in, the, in England, right? So, it's a machine for enclosure. What we see now, however, is the Googles and the Facebooks and they do exactly the opposite. They are enabling and empowering permissionless peer-to-peer -peer relationships. So they are actively promoting and using commons. And they capture value from the commons. So if you look at uh, Uber, 
uh, Airbnb, they are, they are not producing hospitality, right? Uber is not producing mobility. What it does is enabling freelance drivers and users with apps to connect to each other and to create that mobility. So they capture, in this case, a, a surplus value from peer-to-peer -peer market interactions. That's what they enable it and they capture at the same time. So in French there is a really good word for that, but I don't think it's translatable. It's not a capitalist, but a capitalist. So I don't know how you would translate it in English. The capitalists, those that capture, Cap right? The capturists, capturists, right? The capturists. So netarchical capitalism represents, in my view, this shift from a part of the ruling class, a part of the managerial class who controls capital, to an emerging new system. An emerging new system where peers create value, engage themselves in market relationships. Um, so they, they are not paying wages and, and, create, and getting the surplus value from the wages. Um, now, if you believe in the labor value theory, and I'm not a big expert, but I'll try to give you my understanding, right? So by doing this, they dramatically reduce the amount of paid labor in production, right? So they're under the average necessity of labor and therefore they become hyper-competitive, right? Compared to others. Uber is hyper-competitive, Google is hyper Facebook is hyper-competitive compared to their, you know, not netarchical uh, competitors. At the same time though, because they destroy the amount of labor in this production, they destroy the overall capacity for profit making. Think about it. How many people does Facebook actually engage? It's a few thousand, right? So if you look at the evaluations compared to the amount of labor they use, they're hyper productive, but they've also destroyed the, you know, it's the falling rate of profit, right? It's the, they, they destroy the capacity of the system to create profits overall. So it has been calculated, this is, not a, this is not a fantasy, it has been calculated that every million dollars in free software destroys 64 million dollars in, in proprietary software. So this is something I call the value crisis, right? So the, one of the ways I would explain it, the value crisis, is we are going through a shift where more and more people, it's rising exponentially, have the capacity to create use value themselves. The capacity of the system to monetize this use value creation only uh, grows linearly. Right? So you have this increasing gap between a linear growth of monetization and a exponential rise in use value creation through the commons. And this creates a value crisis. Um, so if you look at the history of neoliberalism, the way I would explain it, so 1980s, Tash and Reagan, the counter-revolution, uh, destroyed the linkage between productivity growth and the, the rise in wages, right? So at that moment, you need credit financialization of the system to maintain the purchasing power of the population. That stopped working in 2008. So in that sense, the way capitalism uses this hyper, this new capacity is by actually destroying the purchasing power of the population, right? So distributed labor, there's reports by uh, Trevor Schultz in, uh, in New York that shows the, uh, or Ursula Hus, H-U-W-S, these are reports that analyze the labor conditions in these new exchange systems. The the income is dramatically lower for most people in these new systems, right? So they are actively destroying purchasing power as well as they are shifting to this new model. Okay, so does that make sense? So that's what I mean with netargal capitalism. So when you use netargal capitalism, it's not just a new, a new phase in capitalism. It's, it's saying more than that. It's saying it's actually 
part of this shift of this transition to a new value regime, right? So when, when Roman slaveholders in conditions of declining Roman Empire can no longer afford the repressive apparatus for slavery, when they change to the system of colony, the serfs, they're not just reforming the Roman Empire. Does that make sense? They are, they are actively contributing in subverting the very system on which they depend. When people in a declining feudal system after the 14th century start, start looking for other opportunities and create the commodity form, the East India Company, etc., they're actively contributing to the demise of the system in which they're operating, right? If, if you're a feudal person and you live from your farmers in a feudal way, if you don't change to the commodity form, you're dead. In the next two centuries, if you don't shift, you're no longer playing the game. You become a, a poor feudal, right? You can no longer sustain uh, the old way. Um, okay, so let I continue my, my talk about the technological side. So there is another... Uh, so, so what's the peer-to-peer -peer technology in case of netargal capitalism? It's a form of technology which is peer-to-peer -peer only at the front end. Everything in the back end is under the control of the owners of the platform. Second form, I call it distributed capitalism. So I'm sh I hope you're familiar with Bitcoin, uh, the cryptocurrency uh, which is created uh, by computers. Uh, the design of Bitcoin is based on Austrian economics. So libertarian and economic school, the marginalist utilitarian uh, school of economics. Uh, it's based on a profit motive, right? It has a design, it's the democratization of rent extraction. The idea of Bitcoin is you make it easy to create the coins at the beginning and the algorithm makes it more and more difficult to create these coins. So this, the demand <coughs> for the coins grows faster than the supply of the coins and hence the value of the coins go up. So the people who buy in early, without any work, can sell to other people, <coughs> right? And, and extract a rent from this activity. It's not through productive work, it's through speculative activity. So the, the dream of Bitcoin and related, now a lot of people talk about the blockchain, and I know that Eric uh, talked to a lot of people about it. And, and it's uh, the blockchain, is, is somebody not familiar with the blockchain? I'll quickly explain my own understanding of it. So you should, you should see the Bitcoin as a universal ledger, a universal accounting system, right? So everything you do, instead of being installed on a separate piece of software that is on a particular computer, owned and organized by a particular person, instead becomes part of a universal cloud of accounting. So that's, that's what blockchain does. So anything you want to verify, certify, you can do through the blockchain and, and it's in a, dis, a fully distributed system. But the blockchain belongs to the Bitcoin design. So it's very much in the same ideological sphere. So what the blockchain wants to achieve, for example, is the what they call trustlessness so you no know, I can't trust you one of the answers would be trustfulness in other words like couch surfing which is a universal lodging uh, exchange if I trust you and you trust him then I know I can trust you right so so that there is this a lot of peer-to-peer -peer technologies attempt to do this they attempt to universalize and scale trust and blockchain is the opposite Blockchain says you can't trust human beings, but you can trust the cryptography, right? So you can be for or against this technologically or ideologically, but it's important to know that it's there, right? It's, it's very important to know that these designs are value sensitive. They reflect certain ideas about the world and certain material interests. Uh, so the dream of Bitcoin or the blockchain is a world that consists of fully autonomous but also atomized individuals who can freely exchange with each other if they have property and coins 
uh, without having to trust or go through any third party. That includes the state and includes banks and other third parties. That's the dream of distributed capitalism. Okay. Now, probably I should have turned it around, and because in this uh, version the right-wing economics is on the left, and the left-wing economics are on the right. But anyway, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, maybe you have some ideas. It's just an accident of the seating arrangement in the. All right. Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and and the right side of this of this uh, slide is really what we are working on in the P2P Foundation. There's two different things. So there is a form of peer-to-peer -peer technology which combines a local orientation and a for-benefit orientation. So unlike Bitcoin, it's not for-profit oriented, and unlike Netarchical. It's not centrally controlled. That's what is important in this model. Um, there is a slide which you can find on the on the blog of the P2B Foundation from a Dutch researcher called uh, Tine de Mo. She is a commons historian. And in a little booklet of her called Homo Cooperance, she has calculated the rise in the number of civic and cooperative organizations. So from 1980 to 2005, it's linear. From 2005 until today, it's exponential. So what, what does that mean? It means that today there is an exponential rise in the capacity for self-organization of non-capitalist and non-state actors. This is not dreaming. This is actually happening and started in 2005. Somebody is doing calculations in Belgium. They, they already told me they are coming to the same result. So if you start mapping what is happening around you, you will be surprised at the number of people who are changing energy, energy co-ops, the supply chain for energy, the number of people changing the supply for food, and I know Eric you are participating in that, right? Um, so all these things are growing everywhere, and they're growing exponentially. So this is one of the evidence that I would point towards this transition in a, in a shift, in a value shift. Now the last one on top, the right, uh, is what I'm most interested in. Now, of course, it's important to understand today there is no local anymore. Uh, in the sense that, you know, it's always connected. So if you do a local per food co purchasing group on the internet, you know, there is always a global aspect, to it, right? But it's important to know the precise configuration of the local and the global. Now, in the form of most local movements, what you see is that they use the global for the local. Does that make sense? Think about the transition town movement. The transition town movement is organized globally, but it's all designed to help the local transitions in the towns where groups are active. Right? There is not really a global organization of the transition town movement. They don't see the world that way. They see it as how can we help each other locally? Now, there is another book which I also recommend, but you would have to know French for that. It's called Poor to Poor, Peer to Peer. It's the English subtitle. Uh, and the, the French title, the main title is, well, I forgot right now, but I, I'll find it, I can find it for you. Um, so what is it about? It's about the existence of global coordinated informal economies. I'll give you an example, you probably have seen them, but it's a bit cold in, in Madison, maybe you haven't seen them. So you have these people from Ecuador who play new age pan flute music. Have you ever seen them? And they sell <coughs> alpaga wool and llama wool. They are present in nearly every western city with more than 40,000 people. They have halfway houses everywhere, and every six months, they rotate. And they represent one-third of GDP of this, in, of this province in Ecuador, which is called Otovalo. Mm -hmm. Amazing. You can't see it. It's not a multinational. But it's a business ecosystem in service of a community and its commons. Right? 
Another example, which you may have seen on the beaches, at least in Europe, they're very present. Or in Italian cities where you see the police chasing them all the time. So these are uh, African fraternities from Senegal. They, I think they're called Murabites. So they're Sufi brotherhoods. And they sell not very authentic luxury goods in Europe. Same system. These people are organized on a global level with halfway houses. You can't marry as a young man in Senegal if you haven't done this, because that's how you finance your dowry. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is, this is different, right? Uh, this capacity for a global organization. Okay, another thing mentioned in that book is also interesting. It's Pakistani people getting orders for electronic goods in the western uh, migrant suburbs getting their goods from China, transporting them with these cheap buses all the way to Europe and telling the people in Europe, come at five o'clock in this market to get your stuff. Uh, totally organized at the global scale. So these are called trans-migrant because they don't stay in the West, but they rotate. And in a way, they're very similar to the guild system um, in the Middle Ages. If you were a member of the Florentine, or Venetian guilds, you had halfway houses throughout the Mediterranean. And they had a rotating system for that as well. Now, I just want to make a little argument um, that Douglas Roshkov is making. You know, how, because this is, I think it's uh, interesting. So think about the Renaissance. The Renaissance came after a distributed period, right? The mode of organization of Middle Ages is very distributed. Local cities, local domains, local guilds. So what was the Renaissance about? What did they look at? Well, what they looked at was at the Roman Empire, which was a hyper-centralized system, right? So the Renaissance, according to Douglas Rushkoff in his book Life Incorporated, is a renaissance of centralized thinking and centralized systems. So today we are coming out of these centralized systems. What are we looking at? Oh, we're looking at medieval distributed systems. So you will see that associated with peer-to-peer -peer commons emergence is an enormous amount of social features that have remarkable resemblances with the way medieval times were organized. Can I ask her? Yes. Just a clarification. What, why the use of the word distributed instead of decentralized? Okay. So this is from a you know, famous graph by Paul Baran when he invented the internet or something like that. And he, it's a graph that shows three different things, centralized, decentralized, and distributed. Why make a difference? Um, centralized system, everything flows from the top, right? It's a star network. Decentralized systems, you have different power systems that compete and have balance with each other but they're still centralized within these power systems. So he uses decentralized for that. So we'll make a good example would be the, the airport system in the US. Most flights to the south and the west go to Atlanta. You have no choice. But if you have a car, you can go the way you want, right? So that's the difference between a decentralized system and a distributed system. It's the individual can connect to whomever he wants without asking permission, as opposed to the decentralized system. But of course, in practice, a lot of people mix them and use these terms interchangeably. But in the peer-to-peer -peer system, we make a, you know, in our kind of environments, we make a big difference. Distribution is not decentralized. You can have hubs, but the hubs are voluntary. So let's say you have a village and you have a forest and people have to go to the other village. Well, the first person has to beat the path. It's very likely the second person will say, oh, I, I'm not in the mood of you know, doing a similar path. I'm just going to follow what's already there. But he has freely chosen. Does that make sense? So the hubs in distributed system, they do exist, 
but they're the result of voluntary choices, while in decentralized systems you don't have a choice, you have to go through them. So for example, the web is a client server system. It's a decentralized system, it's not a distributed system. Um, okay, so global commons, I, I finished this part, is the whole idea that if you want this value shift to occur, we need to organize at the global level. So here I come back to the secret plan, here. Um, so this is the way we are working, uh, you know, with people that we connect with. Um, so let me briefly go through this, because this is kind of like a summary of our transition uh, ideas. So here's what we're saying. We are seeing a shift <clears throat> due to the systemic crisis of the dominant system towards sustainability, towards openness, and towards solidarity. <clears throat> so already 10 years ago, was it Paul Hawken or David Corden, I forgot, calculated 2 million sustainability organizations. That was 10 years ago. So it's, it's being done, it's happening. Openness, everywhere you look, it's exponential. You know, the amount of code in Linux, free software systems, open design, it's exponential. And there is a re-emergence now of the solidarity economy and the cooperative economy. I don't know if you're aware in New York, there's a big cooperative alliance being just created right now. I've got a name. I think it's called the Cooperative Alliance in New York. Jackson, Mississippi, Cooperation Jackson, etc., etc. So there is. So what's the problem? The problem is the following. Within those systemic responses, there is fragmentation. So, for example, if you look at sustainability, no, if you look at the solidarity economy in Italy. In the consumer support and agriculture movement, there are 13 different ordering software. Right? They're all doing the same. They're all repeating the same efforts and the same investments. Fragmentation. And you will find it in everyone. Perhaps even more seriously, there is very little convergence, conscious convergence between those two systemic responses. So one of the things we're doing in our transition strategy is uh, creating events, actions, dialogues that create bridges between those systemic responses. So in other words, you know, what, what we want at the P2B Foundation is a mode of production that is at the same time sustainable, open and fair, free, fair and sustainable, that's the way we formulate it. And with free, we mean free to share. That's the word of free when we talk about free. So what is an open source circle economy? It's an economy <coughs> that is at the same time sustainable and open. Now, think you for yourself why this is necessary. If we want a circle economy, which the waste of one production system becomes the raw material for another, how can you do that with privatized logistical systems? Well, I'm not saying it's, impo it's, it's impossible, but it's going to take decades of negotiation. Without transparency in logistics, how can you even start thinking about that, right? So once you have an open logistical system, a participatory ecosystem for production, a circular economy becomes a natural thing to do because you can see it, right? So maybe I should say something about this. So, how do we allocate resources today? One is hierarchy, right? Within a corporation, the allocation of resources happens hierarchically to corporate decision making. If you have a workers' council, you make a decision and it's still allocated <coughs> after the decision. The other way is market pricing, right? We, we allocate resources uh, through the signaling that we get from pricing. Now, how, here's, the, here's the, the important thing. How do we know how to contribute to Linux or Wikipedia or Wikihouse or Wikispeed? Is it hierarchy or is it market pricing? And the answer is none of the above. It is pure mutual coordination, right? You have individuals 
that because they are faced with an open and transparent system, know exactly what they can do. So this is called stigmergy. Stigmergy, the language of social insects, coordination through signaling. Now, this is now the de facto normal situation in the production of immaterial goods like free software and open design. What about physical production? What do we need to do for physical production? Well, we need to translate stigmergy to supply chains and accounting, right? So this is probably worth showing. Um, let's see, um, just a moment. Foundation.net, category, sorry. Why is something working? Account, P2, it's, sorry, it's P2P account. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, just to give you an example, so this is the way we work. So, we have 20,000, 21,000 articles, and this is about the shift in accounting. And we have 413 examples of people working around this shift in accounting. Right? We call it contributory accounting or open value accounting. So just like the shift, the value shift in the 15th century was enabled by the Templars and the, what was the other one? The, the Franciscans with their double book open entry accounting, which they invented or reinvented, I'm not sure, but anyway, it didn't exist. It wasn't known in medieval times. So they created the capacity to, you know, put input and output in balance, right? So every big value shift has been marked by a big shift in, in how we see accounting. So here's one thing that I think is very important. So if you think in terms of class struggle, many people think class struggle is labor fighting with capital for a piece of the pie. No. What is class struggle? Is the capacity to determine what value is, right? That's what, what struggle is about. We have a society in which the only value that is recognized is commodity value determined through the market in its particular way it's organized. If you educate your children at home, you are not producing value. If you have an accident with a tanker, you're producing value. If you're cleaning up voluntarily, you're destroying value. So the accounting system is something very important in a value regime. And so one of the things that the peer-to-peer -peer commerce revolution is doing is looking at how to change accounting systems. So if the, if the workers' revolution was in Leningrad, maybe, Where's the peer-to-peer -peer revolution? It's in Lafarge, Wisconsin. That's where two people are writing the software, value flow software, which is being used by dozens of communities globally. Um, anyway, that's my point of view. <laughs> so it's Wisconsin that's happening. <laughs> in Lafarge. Uh, yeah, in Lafarge. I spent three days with these people, amazing. It's an old couple. Uh, Bob Hogan and Lynn uh, Foster and they're working with all my friends in France and Canada and herbal networks and CSAs in creating this value flow software. The biggest implementation is uh, Sensorica, it's an open scientific hardware community based in Montreal. That's where they are mo most incentively you know, experimenting with this. Um, but anyway, so this is kind of uh, one of the things in this value shift will be a change in accounting. Now, I, I, I did lose my, my thread, but here it is. Let's go back to here. So, um, okay. how much time do I have? Um, I guess it's slated to go till five. Okay. So are you not bored yet? Is it okay? Yeah? Keep okay, going. Go. Keep, Keep going. going. <laughs> okay. So here's an important convergence also that's just as important. So one is deals with nature, openness and sustainability, moving from an extractive economy 
to a regenerative economy in terms of our relationship with nature and natural resources. The other one on the right, openness and solidarity, is moving toward generative economy towards people. And so here's the issue, right? And I, I go back to my analysis of netargal capitalism. So we are a bit in the same situation, in my opinion, as the 18th century situation described by Karl Polanyi in the Great Transformation, the putting out system, right? So you have the emergence of capital. They already have more capital than the workers. So craft workers have to rent machines from capital, buy raw material, they process it at home or in their crafts places, <coughs> and they sell it back to capital. There is no commodified labor in that period, or almost none, right? So what it means is that capitalism is not capable of fully reproducing itself. It needs the ancien regime modified to its purposes to, to grow. Then in 1831, is it, I think, the labor laws, how they're called, the, Anyway, the famous labor laws in, in the UK at that time. Poor law. The poor laws, right. So they abolished the basic income, the spleen and hemland system, which exists in the villages. So people can no longer survive on their own, and they have to move to the cities and work as commodified labor. From that moment on, we can say that capitalism is fully capable of reproducing itself following its own logic. Now, let's take the point of view of peer producers and commoners. More and more people are contributing to these open contributor systems. But in order to reproduce themselves, they can choose between labor condition or freelance condition. In other words, being a slave to, to a master or being a slave to a, an abstract market. So, they're not able to reproduce themselves within the sphere of the commons, right? Okay, so what would you do? Well, as a strategy, what you have to think is how can we create that self-reproduction? And that's where this comes in. So, we have a pretty strong cooperative sector and solidarity economy. I think in the US it's actually 15% or 10%, probably no more than me but it's probably the average in Western countries. It's a fairly strong cooperative economy. That cooperative economy is entirely closed. They do not use the open models, they do not use open contributory systems. So they are basically what Marx called dwarfish forms. They, they're fine, they do better, there's democracy in the workplace, but they're not really competing in any way with the capital system. But what we see is that capitalist firms, netargical capitalists, who invest in the commons, are making an enormous amount of money. So it seems to me it's very clear what needs to be done. It's that the cooperative economy needs to converge and use and adopt these hyperproductive open systems. Or the other way around, I would say, is if you're a commoner, and you want to passionately contribute to a sustainable society and make a living, you need to create open cooperatives. Cooperatives that sustain your capacity to contribute to the commons. So that's what these examples I mentioned are doing. The, you know, these uh, indigenous people from Ecuador and these fraternities in Senegal have created a business ecosystem that allows them to live as a community and to maintain themselves as a community. So what I'm suggesting is that is a strategy that should be followed by the cooperative and solidarity economy. Or on the other hand, if you're a commoner, a peer producer, you're already doing it, is that you create your own vehicles to do this, right? So this is first step. Second step is, well, how do you avoid seepage and value capture? Uh, so we talk about copy fair licenses and reciprocity based licenses. So what's, uh, what's that about? Here is a, a bit of a paradox. So we have, if you're familiar with it, the copyleft movement, the free software movement. So they took copyright, 
it's a wordplay, right? Copy right. It's also on the right. It's about enclosing knowledge. And they made it into copy left. So they hacked the legal system to allow the sharing of knowledge. <coughs> but they're also liberals. And so here's the paradox. The more communistic the license, the more capitalistic the practice. Right? If you say anybody can use it, anybody can contribute, and anybody can use it, that's the very definition of communism by Marx in the 19th century. Then IBM is going to use it. Now, IBM is still okay because IBM is actually paying people. But a lot of companies take, use, and do not contribute at all. Right? So this is a value seepage. And so we think we should move from liberal licenses to socialist licenses. Not communistic licenses, socialist licenses. So the, the principle of socialism was to each according to his contribution. Right? It's not everybody uses what he wants, it's to each according to your contribution. So if I would use Marxist terms, I would say the following. We now have paradoxically a sphere within capitalism of knowledge production that fully functions according to a communist logic. Anybody can contribute, anybody can use. But it's being captured, the value is being captured by profit maximizing firms. What I propose is to surround this cyber communistic sphere with a socialist market sphere. So open co ops, platform co ops that are generative and not extractive vis a vis the commons, they are codependent on. So again, this is happening. So there was a big meeting in New York in November called Platform Cooperativism. And there is a directory called the Internet of Ownership with about 150, uh, the last time I looked. Um, there's all kinds of, I can show you, I have a little copy myself. Let's, uh, let's show it. Oops, sorry. I just because I'd like you to know that everything I'm saying is happening, right? It's a re <laughs> these are all real utopias. Coopera, cooperati. Um, no, what do I do wrong here? Platform. Okay, let me just have a search platform cooperatives that just here. So this is a very a very small directory of my own, not as much as the but you see we have we have platform co-ops in in many different ways and we have art, music, data data co-ops, uh, finance, uh, labor, media, trade, etc. This is a small sample, right? So think about Uber. Uber captures the value of the interconnection between independent drivers and users. Well, you could create a Uber co-op, right? A, something similar like Uber. You create, you write the code, you have a platform, and the, 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 the value that is captured is reinvested by the platform in mobility. You can do that. At that moment, you have a market-friendly form, a, a commons-friendly market form. Okay, so I, I, so you would think, okay, this is this, uh, this, you know, if you're radical, you say, well, this is this is not going fast enough, right, or far, far enough. But here's the thing. So you have a pure stigmergic sphere of immaterial production, people producing code, knowledge, and design. Around that, you have an open cooperative system creating value around these communities for, for the people producing these shared resources. When you start implementing open supply chains and open accounting, you are moving the capacity for mutual coordination from immaterial production to material production. 
at that moment you're outside of the market and you're outside of hierarchical planning. You are in a mutual coordination economy. Um, okay, so I'm just going to conclude with some political uh, ideas, which are the following. So what we are advocating is that the forces of the commons self-organize themselves at the political level. Not necessarily by creating new political parties, you, although they exist, you're know, probably familiar with the pirate parties. The pirate parties are an expression of digital commoners, the file sharing communities, and it's, go it's going to probably will be the governing party in Iceland in the next few months. They have the majority of the voting intention at this stage. You're probably aware of Encomú in Barcelona, which is a commons-oriented political coalition which already runs the city of Barcelona. So, it's possible. Uh, but I'm, I rather propose the following, that all the people at the local level who are engaged in the production of shared resources organize themselves around two organizations, two types of institutions. One is the assembly of the commons, and one is the Chamber of the Commons. The Assembly of the Commons organizes citizens that are engaged in the production and defense of shared resources, produce a social charter, and start supporting political forces that are sympathetic to this shift, to this transition. The Chamber of the Commons organizes the ethical economic organization that create livelihoods for those commons. So, where is that going? There are about eight Assembly of the Commons at this stage. Most of them are in France and Belgium. One is in Ghent. And there is one Chamber of the Commons in Chicago, under construction. Uh, but that's the idea. The idea is to start self-organizing around this shared idea of creating shared resources. The Commons Transition Plan is the idea that, uh, you know, we we have to influence political forces. Let me quickly see where I put this because this is important. Yes. So in 2014, we were invited by the government in Ecuador, who had for a brief moment of time, contemplated moving from an extractive economy to a generative economy. They didn't do it, but they paid us to do the research. It's not too bad. Uh, so here is how that would work. So imagine, you organize your society around common resources. So you'd have an education commons, a science commons, an industry commons, a civic commons, etc. For each of these uh, commons, you would look at what are the enabling practices. If you don't have open textbooks and open courseware, you don't have, access, you don't have an open education commons. For example, if you're an indigenous student from Ecuador, you know, you need to buy every year textbooks that hardly change for $70 every year. And why do they do it, even though they have no money? Because also social prestige. If you are a poor student and you come with a four-year-old textbook, everybody looks down on you. So even though they know they don't really need it, they're still doing it. And they go in debt to do that. So you could imagine, instead of these privatized textbooks, to have a collective of teachers producing a common textbook that is always available, can always be printed, can always be updated for just a few dollars, right? So that's a feeding mechanism for an education course. Now, then we look at material resources. Material resources. If you switch from a private proprietary laboratory to produce science, you move to a lab that's based on open scientific instruments, it can be done for about 90% of scientific instruments today. You save between, it's usually one to eight. So you could have eight times more scientific labs in your country if you systematically work with open labs, right? So eight times more students can produce science if you do that. So these are material infrastructures. Immaterial infrastructure, let me give you an example from Ecuador. Ecuador has a free software decree, but it's not practice. Why? Well, mm -hmm. there's only a few hundred people in Ecuador that have a computing science degree, which is the legal requirement to work for the government. 
they earn $1,500 for the government, but they can earn $3,000 in the private sector or four, five thousand in the U.S. So beautiful law, beautiful decree, no people to do it. Now, because most people today are actually learning to code outside of the university, Ecuador actually has thousands of coders. But they're not recognized. So what do you do? Well, you create open certification systems, peer-to-peer -peer certification systems, and you create a connection with enlightened universities who have some kind of mechanism to recognize these open accreditation systems. And you create a legislation that allows the government to hire people who've gone through that, through that pipeline, right? So this is not material, this is an immaterial intervention, this is a legal hack, if you like. So this is what we did very systematically for Ecuador, and we're not, we've been talking to Syriza, to, to uh, Encomu, and different uh, political forces. And, you know, think about it. Bernie Sanders, I love Bernie Sanders. Uh, Corbyn, I love Corbyn, but they are left New Keynesians, right? If, if they win the elections, they will just do what they thought they should have been doing 30 years ago. There is no vision of the commons as yet in these progressive political forces. So one of the things that we'd like to do is to open dialogues between the commoners and commons-oriented political forces and the traditional left in order to find ways in which uh, they could start thinking in a different way about transitions than just go back to nationalization and, and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of um, my conclusion. I'll just briefly end with this. This is the top layer. And this is science fiction, I must admit. Um, so here is a, here's a clue. If you want to know where any modern political movement gets its ideas, ask them what science fiction books they, they read 30 years ago. <laughs> so mine is Neil Stephenson, The Diamond Age, right? Where he talks about files. So these two, these two examples I gave you, the Ecuadorian indigenous people and the uh, Sufi fraternities, they are files, right? They are far, they are international, they are transnational business ecosystem that sustain communities and their commons. So this is what I want to see at the global level, not just at the local level. Fishery commons are nice, but as long as you have the industrial boat traveling just outside your, your, your 20 mile zone, doesn't matter, right? So we need to organize at the global level, economically, and also politically. So think about the P2P Foundation and SIM organizations. We are not international. Uh, I live in Northern Thailand. I'm now here. Um, we are based in the Netherlands, legally, but it's just one person. And I, we have people everywhere. And we don't think nationally. We don't operate nationally. We think transnationally, because we are a global group of people interested in this transition. Uh, and there are other groups like that, and we work with them, Las Indias, Sensorica, etc. So the idea is to also create, at the global level, interconnections between these transnational groups. I think with that I'll kind of stop, and we can have a conversation or critiques and questions. Um, yeah? Thank you. So let me just say one thing. June 6th to June, June 6 to June 13, I organized with Stephanie Rierich of the Mutual Aid Network, which is based in Madison, Wisconsin. This is an organization that tries to create interconnection between the alternative economy, so time banks, food co-ops, etc. We're going to do one week of value flow mapping here in Madison. It's an open invitation to anyone to cooperate with us and to make it happen here in Madison. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of things. When I was in California and meeting with um, various people, particularly connected to manufacturing issues, they were, even though they're fully engaged in a lot of this thinking, they're completely skeptical about the possibility 
of um, of really getting uh, the distributed local manufacturing. They think that's total bullshit, and um, uh, because uh, and, and that the efficiency problem is huge. They just think that, that of course you can 3D print anything, but it's so much it's so much cheaper to have mass right. production of a nail than right. to 3D print a nail. And there's the, the proportion of the total stuff that is just costs almost nothing to produce if you mass produce it, and costs a lot to produce. And even in the most far forward-looking 3D printers, it'll cost more to produce a screw right. locally, which means that uh, there's going to be large organizations of production that are centralized inevitably. That's right. not. Well, I, I think these people should probably talk with local motors then, because they are they, building 30 different micro yeah, factories. But they, they say that that's just nonsense. They, they do yeah. look at that and they say yeah. it's all hype. They just deny, they deny, they say it's all hype. It's like yeah. Jeremy Rifkin's problem. Right. That it's hype. That, that, um, well, I, I think, you know, concretely what we can see is two different things, right? One is uh, very definitely the, an exponential rise in these mutualized labor spaces. Co-working, fab labs, hacker spaces. Uh, I can give you figures because sure. I've been there uh, in Barcelona from three to fifteen, three years in, in Vienna from one to fifteen in three years. Uh, there's plenty here in Madison. There's one next to our it was called Synergy. Uh, so there's definitely really happening is a mutualization of the workplace and prototypes and prototypal places, like the Fab Labs, right? They don't engage in production. At the same time, you know, they're there. Yeah, so and that was it. The skepticism is just about yeah. production, not about maker spaces and hacker yeah. spaces for prototypes, for example. Right. Or, uh, right. You know, all of that, people are perfectly... Yeah. But so so when, I, when I say cosmolocalization, because I didn't speak about it, but that's the word that we use, right? The, the basic logic is... You know, everything that's light is global and everything that's heavy is local. You know, it doesn't mean a shift from one situation to the other or even a purity. It, it's just like a tendential thing, right? So if I think about local motors, um, I see, you know, they keep proprietary knowledge of their motors, but they crowdsource the design. And, and they are building micro factories. I don't know what's behind it. Maybe it's hype, but I... You know, they're a private company. I, I doubt that they would be building macro factories just for show. I, then I think there is an issue which is the well, cost. micro assembly, but the actual manufacture of the parts. Yeah, but that's possible. But, it's not okay, going to be. Here's the, not here's be the micro. idea. The idea is. You can have micro assembly. Okay, so now, sure. now everything is done in China, or most, most of it is done in China, uh, and it's based on cheap labor and cheap oil. A few years ago, I think, I can't remember what year it was, there was a spike in the oil price, and you were, immediately there was a shift from factories back to Mexico and the U.S. You know, maybe 5%, maybe 7%. So, you know, for me, we, we, we should look at it in, dynamically, right? And, and But those were shifts to factory. The point that the yeah. objection here is not, it's not that it has to be made in China. It's just that certain things are going to be made in big organizations. They may be located in China, they may be located in Dayton. Uh, right. And the transportation costs and things may affect that. Yeah. But they're not going to be, you're not going to have a manufacturer of nails right. in every neighborhood. No, but that's not necessarily what we are saying. It depends, really. You know, I mean, I cannot predict exactly how this is happening. But I, okay, I'll give you one example, which is a famous Belgian example. It's called Molot.be. And I, I don't know if you know this, but the dental stuff doesn't is made in China, right? You probably know this. So you go for it, like a dental thing, you know, you make like a plaster. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? And then based on that, they'll make your, your, your dental thing. That dental thing was, was made in China, in Belgium, until five years ago. Um, Moloch made a 3D printing specialized... Sure. And 90% now of the dental things are actually produced sure. in Belgium. No, there's there, yeah. it, there's plenty of things that can be done in highly localized ways. The more customized is yeah. the product, the more 
efficient, yeah. you can do that. But um, there's a, in terms of the total value in the system, right. there's a huge amount of value that's, that, can't, that would not be produced that way. And the idea that it doesn't remain under control that of uh, centralized institutions, which have to be then controlled one way or another. Right. You know, that's the, that's what they were pushing against when I was right. coming. Well, I, this. Uh, what I'm what I think is that in the context of an ecological crisis in which resources may become more and more expensive, in which transport become more and more expensive in which, according to some studies, two-thirds of the cost of production is actually transportation today, that there, w there is a tendency, f potentially, for this relocalization of production, combined with these global communities that contribute to the knowledge. That doesn't necessarily mean that every neighborhood has you know, something that makes everything, right? I mean, it's between those two polarities, there is kind of a, like a, a really broad area of hybridization, and you know I can I don't know how it's going to happen, but I, I I think it's real. That's what I'm. That's you know I, I still think it's something that's real, that, that's tendentially there as a new potential model. You know, you can small examples would be uh, the farmers workshop in France. So these are eco farmers, and they are, they don't have the machinery they want from agribusiness. So what they're doing is every two weeks, somewhere in France is a workshop. And the farmer pays 1,000 euro, which may seem a lot, but actually at the end of the week they produce a machine that is, that if it would exist in the market, is estimated to be 15,000 euro, right? Uh, so these are not workshops. I mean, they're not micro factories, but it's a model that combines the mutualizing of the knowledge of all these farmers and then local workshops where everybody does the barn raising, if you like, to actually make each other's machines. And that seems to be working very well. I mean, they have really hundreds of designs. And if you look at their agenda, it's full. You know, it's the whole next 18 months. You have some workshop somewhere. You know, that's kind of a hybrid system, right? They it's not, it's not a for-profit company, it's eagle farmers, you know, concerned about the cost of machinery, about the lack of appropriate machinery for their particular purposes, about, concerned about maintaining their independence from agribusiness, there's all this, a whole series of motivations that, that for them, push them towards a situation where they want to make their own machines. In the US, farm hack is pretty big too. You know, of course, I know, you know, compared to the, the weight of agribusiness, right. you know. Um, well, it's not, so, yeah, yeah. The, the issue is not so much how big it is now relative to multinationals. Obviously, multinationals control a huge amount of total value. Yeah. But uh, whether, <clears throat> what, what the degree of potential is, and therefore, yeah how much we still have to contend with the problem of controlling right. capital, as opposed yeah. to just simply subverting it by the production right. of these systems. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, it would be nice if it would be all subvertible by just building right. these alternatives. No, I agree that that's and probably not realistic. Yeah. The, well, the, the other thing, just in, in terms of how, what's the most probable way of constructing a, a new set of rules which would enable an appropriation of part of the value that's currently being generated uh, to um, provide livelihoods for people who are fully engaged in the P2P. So your your impulse is something like the copy fair and reciprocity license to create the shell around it so that corporate extractors have to pay for it. Yes, yes. Um, or or the, the, I mean, there's a really interesting example by Inspiral, I don't know if you know them in New Zealand. I, I find them quite inspiring because, okay, generally speaking, when I give a, a talk, and especially people on the left, they would always say, you know, it's going to be co-opted by the system, right? This is kind of like the standard, you know, don't even start talking about it, you know, we know you can't change capitalism, uh, well, let's just critique it. So, uh, Inspiral says the opposite, it says, 
you know, we can co-op them, right? Right. Like so they have this. It's called capped returns investment, uh, and there is an article about it in Yes magazine. If you if you want to check it, so capped return means that they actually accept extractive capital, but they cap the return. So they say you'll get maximum ten times your money back, and that may sound like a lot. For a venture capitalists, that is not a lot because they want these unicorns. And then we'll 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 make a ceremony and we'll ceremoniously gift this resource to the commons and we'll thank you for it. So this is uh, for me an interesting approach because what they do is they it allows them to grow, to become stronger, get you know get capital, which is very not easy to find. But at the same time, to discipline that extractive capital so that it doesn't destroy their their, their own ethics and their own way of doing things, right? So I, I think this is the general way of, 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 of you know, it's, it's a pragmatic approach. Like, here's how we want to do it. I know you don't live in the world we like to that we want. But it doesn't mean we can't do anything. Let's see what we can do okay. to reinforce that other side. So the, I mean, yeah. as, as I, we briefly talked about last year when you were here, the other way of imagining how you could provide a substantial transfer of social surplus from the capitalist sector to the uh, common sector or and other yeah. similar things is through basic income, Yes. where you use the state to just directly tax the surplus and, right. and allocate it this way. And um, particularly since basic income seems to be back on the agenda, in a big way in some places. Uh, as I might have mentioned to you, when I was in California, when I mentioned it at a talk in San Francisco, the audience burst into cheers and applause. Yes. And, uh, and a, a generous basic income is affordable. You know, there's no economic obstacle to it. There's politi huge political barriers, but there's no economic obstacle. Yeah. And it's simple, it's so administratively simple uh, doesn't require the kind of monitoring that any licensing mechanism requires. Right. And then courts to enforce, you know, it's just a, a simple... And yeah, I, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to the idea, but I, I guess my fear is that, uh, you know, the way it's embraced, including by Silicon Valley uh, people, but also, you know, like really influential people in Silicon Valley, you know, it's going to be at a very low end this basic income. Well, that's the, the question is, right? that's, I think, what's the political issue is, right. can you fight for a yeah. freedom yeah. enhancing basic income as opposed to a wage subsidy basic yeah. income? Yeah, so they, they had this, uh, in Finland, they have this uh, whole debate around basic income, and they, when you ask the people themselves, the people say, like, we would like 1,100 euro, which is not very high. The politicians bring it down to 800 euro, and now they're going to experiment this in some, you know, some limited uh, region or city. Um, with 800 euro in Finland, you can hardly pay your rent. You know what I mean? Um, so it's not a magic bullet. That uh, I mean, it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting to make it higher. Um, yeah, I just from from the you know. So it's it's one thing to say that if we're going to argue, if, if the debate's going to be on the pragmatics of whether a you can have sufficiently enforceable and monitorable licenses on open source materials such that you could generate a flow of value to sustain the commons through that mechanism, and what's the overhead costs of yeah. that versus an unconditional simple basic income that's set high enough to provide for a livelihood. I don't see any, it's not obvious to me that the licensing strategy has no, it's more pragmatism right. to it. Well, it, it's just that um, and it does as long as you don't have a basic income, it's the only thing you can do. Well, but you, we can't do and it, this is the thing. We can't do it in an enforceable, and it, it reinforces the notion of property rights and it requires a monitoring mechanism that's not simple. And well, you know, the, the record of the copyleft license is pretty good in Creative Commons. It works, it's enforced by yeah, the but courts. But they, yeah, but they're not requiring a flow of 
resources from it. That's no, but it's, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, I'll give you an example. It's called the Fair Shares Association. It's a property model, like one quarter of the shares for the funders, one quarter for the founders, one quarter for the workers, and one quarter for the users. That's It comes from the solidarity economy in the UK. It's pretty small, but they have a a double Creative Commons licensing scheme, which is very simple. Um, everybody can use a Creative Commons non-commercial, use all their material, but if you want to do a commercial activity, you have to pay a membership and then you get the Creative Commons commercial license. That's it. So in this case, the reciprocity is the membership fee which allows organization to exist. You know, it's not rocket science and it's, I don't, it, you know, it's not too difficult to enforce, I think. You know, it's... My, what, what, I yeah. guess what I'm skeptical of is that it can generate a big, that, that the set of those mechanisms could generate a significant enough value flow away from capital accumulation towards commons accumulation no, it's, it's, I, well, to actually underwrite, to actually provide the livelihoods yeah. for the commons, which is what the point is. Uh, as so he, here's the thing. So we 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 have plenty of examples of working co-ops, right? They they work, they exist, they make money, and they've been surviving and even thriving for a long time. Um, if these people would start opening up their knowledge, right? Turning them into a commons. Then, then we have this fear already. But before you get there, you need examples. Does that, does that make sense? So I, I, you can't say to Mondragon, you should open your licenses if you don't have examples. So that's why you need these you know, pioneering, pragmatic, difficult experiments in order to achieve something bigger later on. Th that's the thing. Uh, it's, you know, it's very pragmatic. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I think I guess what, what's you know for me very important, and uh, we had this discussion of the number of freelancers you know in the U.S. economy. Um, you know, in my world, everybody is like that, right? I mean, I only meet people like that, but it's it's my world. My world is people who are autonomous, you know, work for themselves, don't get salaries, and I I think there are millions of them. I can't prove it, but I meet them every day. And this is what these people are concerned with, you know. How, what can I, how can I do what I really want to do, and how can I make a living? And, and that's where these discussions occur. You know, it's very pragmatic, very... Uh, but in my view, you know, this is how change works, not because some ideological decision, but because people are pragmatically looking for alternatives in their daily lives. And it makes sense to shift in that direction at you know at varying speeds and uh, yeah yeah could you comment on the pope's encyclical and his concept of the common good as a way to reorganize the idea of a kind of the future economy um, yeah i you know so the bridge is that this whole idea of you know, the, the copy fair license, actually for me it's mostly ideological, to be honest. So it's, it's a way to bring into the discussion the idea of a moral economy, of a generative economy, right? Because what for me typifies liberalism is this idea that if we're all selfish, automatically things go well. And, and that's a very profound idea that's been dominant for 400 years. And the idea of a moral economy is, you know, we need an economy which doesn't destroy nature and doesn't impoverish people. And instead of having a state from the outside that regulates selfish actors, you want actors that are internally regulated. You still need some, you know, outside control. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about, you know, this shift to ethical entities, generative entities. Um, and I think, in, in ideological terms, the, what the Pope does, you know, represents that shift. It's a shift that's that's not, you know, it's everywhere. 
like social entrepreneurship, blended value, B corporations, even within capitalism, you know, people are increasingly realizing that, you know, they're fucking it up, right? So, so it's part of this shift, and you have people who are anti-capitalist who are doing this shift, and you have people within, you know, their their worldview are also trying to find ways out. In, so, in, in this sense, I find, uh, you know, Thomas Piketty, the Pope, as kind of cultural markers. Does that make sense? Like, they they show that, you know, there's this incredible study in Germany, you know, that 70% of the population is in total agreement with that with the shifts that are needed in the world. Like, people are for this, right? Uh, and they weren't maybe 30 years ago, but you know the, the majority of the population in Germany, you know, wants a shift towards sustainability. Even conservative people. That doesn't mean we get there, but you know, it's part of this kind of. Uh, yeah. So I think the right man at the right moment to, you know, to help this cultural shift is a good thing in my view. That's that, that's more on the sustainability dimension than on the solidarity dimension. The shift that is. Yeah, the, yes. the, the, the yes. threat of global warming and climate change has gotten through to most right. people outside yeah. the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sustainability yeah. is still self-interested for one's grandchildren, if not for oneself, yes. in a way that solidarity implies actually having to give up something. Yes, it's more easy. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.